Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, we have come to the last part of this course and uh, in this lecture, I'll be trying to briefly summarize what we have uh, discussed so far uh, in different, uh, under different themes and uh, roughly we have covered ar around uh, 19 different themes uh, in this course on ecology and society. I'm sure uh, uh, by going through the lecture slides and at the same time the uh, readings which are being provided, uh, you'll be able to grasp uh, certain uh, concepts and meanings which we have discussed and also uh, partly some of the case study which are being covered in the, in the course. And uh, uh, we begin by looking at uh, the uh, brief introduction of a uh, few concepts like what is ecology, what is environment and the difference between uh, ecology and environment which uh, perhaps is often uh, used interchangeably or maybe uh, uh, which represent almost the same meaning. But uh, if you look at in depthly, uh, ecology and environment is different and ecology rather looks at the kind of relationship which are being shared among the animate and in a, inanimate uh, in the natural surroundings. Environment in a way is the uh, natural surroundings where this animate and inanimate uh, inhabits. And also we begin uh, looking at uh, the whole idea of uh, what ecology is and what environment is within the context of sustainable development which is uh, first uh, defined by the WCED. And now why is the need for looking at uh, ecology from different perspective and as I said uh, ecology the subject of ecology has been the area of concern mostly for the geographers, ecologists and biologists. And uh, in the past few decades, uh, we, even within the social sciences like anthropologists and sociologists are pretty much concerned about looking at uh, ecology and the environment in general is mainly because uh, there has been an increasing realization that uh, uh, there is an injustice which is being done to different certain sections of people in the context of development. And also we have discussed the kind of inequality which uh, exists uh, in the context of the distribution of resources where only a handful really get benefit and control the resources. And uh, we also have uh, certain uh, terminologies like environmental racism where uh, the context of North America where the black people are being looked at or being marginalized and the ecological needs are being seen as where uh, the human waste are being dumped. Now, uh, these are some of the uh, growing concerns uh, which have been perhaps witnessed in the past few decades and also the kind of uh, development policies and planning which are being initiated uh, mostly uh, in the land of uh, the indigenous people or native societies are 
being seen as uh, a new form of colonization. Now, uh, take any development projects like maybe mining, dam, or maybe even the construction of roads, so on and so forth. Uh, the people at the receiving end are usually the indigenous people and their perceptions or voice are hardly being taken into account when these decisions are being made. Now, uh, as a result of all this, uh, the indigenous people uh, have been uh, marginalized and uh, their uh, means of livelihood are at, at stake and their resources are being used up in which they have been innately, you know, being very much uh, embedded and connected with. So, therefore, this the question or the debate of this sustainability arises because for quite long these indigenous peoples are perceived to be sharing a pretty much uh, a harmonious relationship with nature and as a result of all these uh, maybe the ecological injustice which are being meted out to them and also the kind of unequal, unequal distribution of resources and also like uh, the instances of environmental racism which are being witnessed all these have in a way being uh, you know clubbed together and then the whole idea of this sustainability is being uh, questions and if that is the case what perhaps is the answer in looking at what sustainable development is so what are the kind of alternative which is being you know looked upon and then uh, based on the kind of studies and literatures and mostly in the uh, ecological anthropology we are in a way trying to look at some of the you know challenges and the possibilities which are being seen in the literature now we also begin by uh, trying to look at uh, uh, how do we understand culture and how does one perceive culture the reason why this culture becomes important is because uh, in the anthropology and under the sub theme of cultural ecology uh, many studies are being conducted uh, to understand the human nature relationship in the past generations now what then is culture as we had discussed cultures are nothing but uh, it is a shared ideas and also the kind of meanings which are being attributed uh, in, within within the society within that particular cultural group and as a result of this uh, uh, different kinds of behaviors are being institutionalized and uh, uh, as, as time passes by, it becomes part of uh, that particular cultural group. And culture can be implicit and also at the same time ex explicit. And uh, uh, as we had discussed in the symbol making, making processes, how does one make uh, symbols? It is a sign and uh, the kind of uh, meanings which are embedded in symbols uh, also does have an implicit and explicit meaning. Uh, the implicit meanings are more latent and whereas the explicit are more manifest which is observa observable and which in a way is being strongly expressed by that particular cultural group. Now what then uh, does cultural ecology uh, attempts to look at and study? It normally tries to look at the way in which uh, a group of people make sense or try to adapt with their environmental setting and also uh, through the use of certain kind of uh, technology and in, in terms of adjusting where, with their environment or maybe by you know uh, in the pursuit of their means of livelihood and also uh, we have this uh, idea of these uh, cosmology or world, world view where a uh, different uh, cultural group has a uh, different idea or understanding of how they make sense of their 
environment. And through that, uh, uh, it, it, it sort of tries to depict and uh, we have come across certain ways of uh, their uh, relationship and also how they uh, you know, uh, perceive and uh, behave uh, in, that, in that particular environment. And then all these, in a way, are being uh, institutionalized uh, within that particular uh, cultural rubric. Now, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, uh, the cultural ecology in the context of uh, economics, it, it rather tries to, uh, you know, bring us or, or make sense of the kind of subsistence strategies uh, which a particular culture group has, you know, uh, dealt with. And in, in this, uh, we have this idea of how a particular culture uh, group adapt by using certain kind of technology in, in making sense of not just their environment, but also through their economic practices. For instance, we have uh, certain subsistence strategies like the hunting gathering society, for example, and also the foraging community. Now, depending on their societal or basic needs, people engage in tries to look at or how they make sense of uh, their environment. And then Marx come up with uh, uh, an idea of how uh, in primitive society, people engage mostly in the ascetic mode of production, for example. Now, in ascetic mode of production, there is no concept of property and then uh, there is no sense of individual ownership. Now, it, it is more or less based on the communal, if not the communitarian ideas of how, uh, you know, they engage in making sense of uh, their means of livelihood. Now, there are also certain constraints uh, in the context of environment. Now, for example, maybe uh, the population growth and also maybe certain other environmental con constraints like uh, maybe the weather, the climatic change, so and so forth. Now, depending on this, uh, people tend to, you know, adopt and then uh, make sense of their environment by engaging in uh, a different kinds of mechanism. Now, also, we have different modes of production, as I was saying, uh, this idea of uh, ownership, in a way, has took a dramatic shift when people in the Neolithic period, when they start engaging in agriculture. In agriculture practices, as we all know, uh, you have, you know, the evolution of this technology at the same time, the sense of ownership uh, has changed. As a result of this, the relationship between human and their environment or land and forest has also changed to a large extent. Now, uh, moving on, uh, we have also uh, looked at uh, the various strengths of uh, human ecology, what is human ecology and also why is there a need of uh, human ecology and, and what does human ecology in a way tries to look at. It, it strongly, you know, uh, uh, espouses this idea of looking at the uh, how uh, human interact with their environments. This is perhaps one of the main uh, crux of uh, the study of human ecology. And uh, if you try to look at the background, there are different, you know, uh, threats to the bi biodiversity. For instance, uh, pollution, for example, we have different kinds of pollution, air pollution, water pollution, so on and so forth. The kind of waste which are usually being dumped on the ocean, the river, in a way have uh, pose a certain kind of equal reaction to the human society uh, and also, I mean, not necessarily to biodiversity, but the pollution of biodiversity in a way has an impact on the human population as well. And also we have these processes of urbanization. Now, uh, it looks cool to look at the post areas and then 
many cities which are being coming up but we seldom uh, don't really give you know attention to the kind of consequences which causes as a result of this process of urbanization for example now with the uh, in, in this process of urbanization you can actually see how you know the rural populace are actually moving towards the urban spaces now as a result of this there is an increasing demand for you know open spaces and also people have sent this uh, agriculture farming and then they move towards the urban area which are more engaged into trading and you know the productions are mostly uh, dependent on uh, the industry and the factory system now in that uh, the kind of people's uh, heavily dependent of machines and uh, uh, with, with the pursuit of uh, you know multiplying their production has in a way uh, uh, caused a serious impact and consequences to the biodiversity as well and uh, as there is an increasing pace of this urbanization or maybe the expansion of cities and as a result there is uh, an increasing demand for resources like for instance uh, the wood the timbers you know for uh, building different kind of infrastructure and uh, as a result of this there is uh, these consequences of this deforestation and the farming practice also has changed uh, uh, to a large extent because earlier people were engaged mostly uh, in, in using simple technology and engaging in subsistence uh, you know uh, agriculture uh, modes of production but as a result of this the influence of this uh, urbanization at the same time may, maybe with the cap idea of this capitalist the, intrus the intrus intrusion of this capitalist mode of production people tends to you know engage in using different kind of technology by not more or less not taking into account the kind of uh, adaptability to that particular environment and they start engaging using different kinds of you know fertilized chemicals so on and so forth which in a way is not really sustainable in the long run now here is here also we come across the idea of this sustainability the question how we tries to you know uh, address this uh, process of this sustainability is it this practices really sustainable and of keep aside the threats to the biodiversity now uh, if you look at this human activities for the past generation in a way also has uh, posed certain kind of uh, a deep scar or danger to the kind of environment because humans are exposed to those kind of harmful impact and, effort, uh, and effects to the different environment now uh, human ecology also tries to look at the kind of uh, how investigating the individuals uh, or the individual society to interrelate with nature and uh, with their environment now if you look at the kind of uh, human environment uh, interactions now for instance uh, there are modes of adaptation to a particular space now uh, despite this there is an increasing realization that uh, uh, human in a way has you know uh, posed a certain kind of you know uh, uh, consequences or danger to the environment now uh, for instance if you look at the chicago school uh, the human community or the human populace became the central concern because uh, the Chicago School of Thought regarded human community as you know a part of the subsocial and the subcultural entity and and which also belongs to the natural order like for example the biotic plant and the animal communities now uh, 
uh, in human ecology, uh, uh, if you look at uh, the classical Chicago school has in a way come up with two different trends of understanding this human ecology and, and then they develop, they develop uh, two different theoretical approaches in trying to understand human ecology. The first one is uh, environmental determinism. Now, what is environmental determinism? It is a deterministic approach uh, which assigns uh, one factor as you know a dominant influence in explanation. And uh, environmental determinism in a way is based on the assumption that cultural and natural areas are uh, coterminous because culture represents an adaptation to the uh, particular environment. Now, therefore, these environmental factors in a way determine human social and cultural behavior. So, it does not really, you know, uh, tries to uh, draw a boundary you nor know, try to segregate and differentiate between the two because uh, uh, the human uh, behavior, the cultural practices, or maybe uh, even the economic practices, or maybe the subsistence strategies are to a large extent being influenced by the environment. Now, therefore, this idea of determinism in a way, you know, emphasis uh, on the philosophical position that people had about their relationship between men and nature. Now, it, it tends to look at, uh, in, a, in a more critical manner, the kind of relationship which is being shared between men and nature. And environment determinism also uh, looks at how the human conditions uh, uh, are, you know, being defined by this determinism. In other words, the human behaviors, for example, like the lifestyles and the economy of living are pretty much conditioned by the environment. Now, therefore, this uh, uh, determinism in a way gives uh, a maximum emphasis on the value of nature. Now, therefore, men cannot, can't afford or uh, really stay out of the influence of nature. Now, in contrast, this free will approach lays emphasis on human capacity and potential. The potential to, you know, adapt at the same time, make use of the resources. It holds that man has a free will capacity to challenge and change the power of nature. Now, for example, like the storm, the flood, drought, etc. Now, humans have that capacity of, in a way, to modify this force of the environment through the use of technology. Now, perhaps uh, uh, from the Western uh, rationalist point of view, science and technology in a way is, you know, uh, capable enough to encounter, if not meet any kind of the environmental challenges. They are being guided by this idea. Now, here comes the importance of the human consciousness that is which signifies man's active involvement in the manage of the environment. Now, on the other hand, uh, environmental possibilism in a way uh, asserted that while the environment did not directly cause specific cultural developments, the presence of absence or this specific environment in a way place limits on such development by either, you know, uh, permitting or forbidding their occurrences. Now, for example, as I had already discussed uh, in the uh, lectures on human ecology that, uh, for instance, the, the island peoples could be seafarers, but residents of, for example, like the Inner Mongolia might not be so because of the inhabitants of the temperate regions might practice agriculture, but those living in Arctic latitudes could not. Now, over here, you have this uh, idea of how uh, this uh, notion of this possibilism in a way uh, took place. Now, as we had also discussed the what uh, the American anthropologist L. Crowber talks about uh, uh, in the context of North Western America that uh, 
uh, which, which adopt the practice of these maize agriculture from their southern neighbors because of the frost free growing season in the region was shorter than the four months uh, required for the maize plants to reach maturity. Now their environment does you know limited the ability of their culture to evolve in an agriculture direction. Now a possibly stance was uh, perhaps also being taken by the British historian Arnold Tone B in his multi-volume which we had discussed in the study of history and in which he had argued that the development of civilizations could be explained in terms of their responses to environmental uh, challenges. Now, uh, we have two different trends of looking at that is the environmental determinism and the other is the environmental possibilism. Now, uh, in the ecological anthropology, uh, we had also discussed how this idea is being influenced by the works of uh, Charles Darwin, that is the origin of species. And, and we had also discussed that uh, Charles Darwin, in a way, was, was being influenced by, you know, uh, the works of Malthus in his issue on population. What Malthus has actually argued was with the, you know, increasing rise of human population, it in a way pose a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, not really threat, but then uh, it, 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 it pose a certain kind of uh, uh, anxiety to the available resources. Because as the population increases, uh, there is an increasing uh, uh, realization that, you know, the resources might not really be uh, sufficient enough to meet the needs of uh, the increasing population. So there will be a certain kind of imbalances. Now, uh, there is also different uh, ways of looking, for example, the ethnoecology, how uh, a particular communities uh, share different kind of thoughts and understanding about their ecology. And, and in that, they have different practices, for example, the subsistence strategies as we had discussed. Now, uh, increasingly, uh, there has been uh, an attention being paid to uh, this approach called ethnoecology, where uh, the certain kind of uh, beliefs, not just uh, their ideas, everything which, which a particular community has uh, to a particular, you know, environment or ecology is to be looked at. Now, why is there, there is an increasing, uh, the idea, the relevance of this eco ecological anthropology. Now, ecological anthropology, if you look at today, is pretty much relevant uh, to the contemporary concerns with the state of this general environment, because anthropological knowledge has, in a way, the potential to inform and instruct uh, humans about how to construct a sustainable ways of life. Remember, the sustainable or sustainability should, in a way, be the starting point of uh, this particular course. Now, uh, bio biological diversity, again, is necessary for the adaptation and survival of all species. Now, cultural diversity may serve a similar role for the human species because it is clearly one of our most important mechanism to uh, adaptation. Now, therefore, in uh, ecological anthropology, culture is also given utmost emphasis and importance. And this new perspective, in a way, considers the role of the physical environment in cultural change in a more sophisticated manner than environmental determinism. And ecological anthropology is also a reaction to idealism, which is the idea that all objects in nature and experience are representation of the mind. Now, we had also uh, looked at how 
uh, uh, I mean the cultural materialism was developed by Marvin Harris and in cultural materialism it, it, it tries to look at how human engages uh, in using different kinds of strategies in terms of you know their means of uh, production and uh, Roy Rappaport also uh, construct two uh, three particular you know uh, processes or concepts that is the first one is new functionalism and this term in a way represents a productive but short lived uh, you know uh, beginning from the 1960s and new functionalism in a way attends explicitly to the uh, modeling of system level interaction especially negative feedback and assigns the primary importance to techno environmental forces especially environment ecology and the population and within this new functionalism culture is reduced to an adaptation and functional behaviors are homeostatic and deviation counteracting and also serving to maintain the system at large. Now, new functional well-being is measured in tangible currencies such as population density that relate to fitness as in uh, evolutionary biology processes. Now, the second one that is the carrying capacity again uh, is uh, the number of individuals inhabited that can support. That is, uh, if we go by uh, there have been uh, the Malthusian theory that is if the population increases it multiplies it in a way will pose a threat to the carrying capacity of that particular geographical area or space. This idea is related to you know population pressure referring to demands of population of the resources of its ecosystem. If the technology of a group shift then the carrying capacity changes as well. An example of the application of carrying capacity within anthropology is demonstrated in Rappaport's study of the Shambhaga Marine, which we have extensively talked about uh, in the context of the you know, uh, Shambhaga Marine in, in, in trying to look at uh, how this carrying capacity actually you know, functioned. Now, in this, uh, we also in a way try to look at the kind of how different functions in a way uh, look at. Now, uh, among the Sambaga community, there, there are two modes of you know, function that is latent function and manifest function when epic is being sacrificed. Now, a latent function in a way is you know, explicitly stated and recognized or intended by the people involved in it, thus they are able to be identified by the observer. Now, for example, uh, uh, for in the, you know, the rituals of those sacrificing the pig, the latent function of the sacrifice is the presence of too many pigs, while its manifest, manifest function is the sacrifice of pigs to the ancestor. Now, this manifest function is rather explicitly stated and understood by the participants in the relevant action. Now, it is here important also to look at the kind of, uh, you know, looking at the cultural core which is developed by uh, Julian Stewart. Now, in cultural core, it is the people that is the kind of perception or ideas or knowledge which they have. Uh, becomes important. Now, uh, moving ahead, there are, there are two ways of, you know, uh, models which are developed within the ecological anthropology. That is, the first one is the ecosystem model uh, of human ecology and the second, uh, second is the actor-based model. Now, what then is the ecosystem-based model? Now, uh, the American anthropologists uh, Andrew Vaidya and Roy Rappaport in a way suggested that instead of studying how cultures are adapted to the environment, attention should be rather focused on the relationship of specific human population to the specific ecosystem. 
Now, as we had, uh, you know, uh, at length discuss about Rappaport's uh, understanding or contribution towards ecological anthropology, uh, not just in the uh, sacrificing of the pigs for the ancestor, but also religion in the making of humanity and uh, how richer religion in a way uh, are all, you know, uh, responsible in trying to make sense of the environment. Now, in their view, uh, these human beings constitute simply another population among the many populations of plants and animal species that interact with each other and with the non-living components, for example, the climate, soil, water of their local eco ecosystem. Now, uh, if you again looked at this, uh, the actor modeled of human ecology. This actor based uh, model of human ecology uh, has become uh, a major new uh, wave in human ecology that is adaptations occurs at the level of individuals rather than the cultures or populations. Earlier when we discuss uh, in, in, in the you know ecosystem based model, the culture becomes important. But in the actor based model, it is the individual which, which is given a priority and importance. Now, this model reflects both anthropological concerns with individual decision making processes and also the evolutionary biologist's uh, current preoccupation with showing that natural selections operate exclusively at the level of individual organism. Now, this perspective, uh, in a way, uh, you know, tends to look at uh, the human social system, the communities, the ecosystem, which exists only as the fortuitous outcome of interaction among many individual organisms. Now, therefore, this theory is concerned with the general properties of the structures and functions of system as such, rather than within their uh, specific contents. Now, uh, uh, moving on, uh, we, we try to also look at the nature culture uh, debate and how, how is nature perceived and how is culture perceived because there are different differing notions of uh, trying to perceive and understand what nature and what culture is. Uh, nature, in a way, is the physical uh, setting where you know the plants, animals, so on and so forth, uh, in its natural surrounding. In a way, the uh, naturalism uh, is pretty much exhibited here. Culture, rather, is something which changes, and the kind of notion, belief, perceptions, behavior, so on and so, are uh, being you know practices within uh, a cultural group. Now, the nature and culture divide, in a way, has emerged at certain point of time. Now, for instance, prior to the Renaissance period, this idea of ordering or keeping aside this nature, uh, different from culture, uh, was not really uh, prevalent. But uh, uh, the post of, from the period of Renaissance, uh, this idea of uh, othering the nature or the dichotomy uh, or the binary which exists between nature and culture has emerged. And culture in a way is to be you know located or seen from the ecological niche because uh, within that particular ecological space uh, culture is being you know established in terms of I, the kind of I, uh, behavior and then action which are being embedded in that particular culture community. Now, uh, symbol in a way is sort of uh, an expression in terms of relating with that particular environment by using certain kind of signs and uh, uh, it, it, it sort of represents and denotes that particular cultural group. Now, how does the Anthropologists, in a way, perceive a difference between nature and culture, or, or does it see nature and culture as 
something different. This is uh, this was something which we had you know uh, strongly try to look at and then discusses by taking different viewpoints of the anthropologies and and within this what makes culture so much distinct uh, is, is because uh, human in a way have that sort of uh, imaginings and this idea in a way has enabled human to you know develop and and if, even if you look at the kind of the evolutionary theories or the stages of human evolution which move on from simple to complex and then to a much more complex society. Now therefore in each and every stages of uh, human evolution we come across certain kinds of culture which are being uh, embedded in that. Now uh, why has nature uh, been looked at uh, as a contested concept. Now the critique of culture and this plurality of this nature uh, is being looked at for example like the works of Latour and then so uh, and, and others and then how they try to establish uh, uh, nature as something which is different and then and is, is, is how human tries to you know develop certain kind of relationship with nature. Now uh, if you look at this uh, the materialistic uh, conception of history perhaps Marx uh, had uh, stated that human engage uh, in, the, in, in the, the first form of action was through their means of you know livelihood like, like for example agriculture. Now in agriculture practices man enters into a relationship with nature so as to you know uh, not, not, not just uh, primarily for the means of livelihood but through that they, they enter into certain kind of uh, the materials uh, aspect of human. Now Marxian approach also tries to look at how uh, human and nature in a way has the relationship has been transformed because uh, as a result of this the industrialism or the capitalist mode of production nature is seen to be you know which which can be subdued and then which can be exploited in order to satisfy the uh, needs of human because nature is no more seen to be or perceived to be uh, sharing a harmonious relationship with human but rather as something which, which can be in a way exploited in order to satisfy the needs of human. Now therefore the kind of modernization process which takes place in a way has you know changed altogether the idea and the picture of human and nature relationship. Now uh, if you look at the natural and the supernatural uh, binary oppositions. Now there are different modes of categorization. Now for example uh, the totemic belief and the animist system. Now in totemism it, people tends to you know uh, share certain kind of relationship with nature by uh, espousing that certain kind of plants or animals in a way represent uh, that particular uh, cultural group and uh, that way that sort of uh, the understanding or the perception of this uh, the, the prevalence of this supernatural again is prevalent in the animist system. Now this kind of this conceptions of nature has evolved over a period of time. Now uh, with, the, with the coming of uh, you know the western rational thinking now what, we, what, what, what is also known as the Cartesian anxiety which we had discussed. Now this idea of uh, the ecological relationship and the social practices of human has evolved and this conception has changes and so is our attitudes and behavior towards nature. Now uh, as we all know uh, human uh, is a choice making uh, you know species. 
in a sense because uh, for example if you take the example of the foraging community like the hunting uh, societies they in a way uh, evolve by adapting to the environment by using different strategies in terms of hunting and uh, we have this process of enculturation or enskillment now if you look at the works of the uh, team in goal in the dwelling perspective which we talk about now the hunting societies also share, share certain kind of relationship with the environment by you know uh, making a rightful choice of which animal to hunt and to, uh, in, in what particular type of season and and this sort of uh, you know strategy can be in a way uh, stated as a rational choice now this choice in a way is being uh, managed and then adaptable with, with the kind of changes in the environment as well now therefore the even in the foraging community the humans are in a way guided by this reason and therefore nature becomes sort of an agent of selection because human are pretty much now you know influenced by the kind of the natural surroundings now there is this idea of uh, different notions in, or in or paradigms in these human environmental uh, uh, relations that is the idea of this orientalism paternalism and communalism now over here i'll just try to you know like uh, emphasize more on communalism because in communalism the sense of you know private ownership or individual uh, you know ownership was not present and and therefore this idea of society was more egalitarian and uh, there was no sense of this hierarchy now in a way if you recall when we discuss about social ecology by Murray Bookchin Bookchin in a way tries to uh, you know address the environmental problems which we are facing now is pretty much embedded in the human society because these are perhaps the human problems because he tries to you know by bringing in the kind of hierarchy which exists uh, between uh, different sections of the society and this hierarchy in a way is responsible for the kind of uh, environmental crisis which we are facing now if you look at the kind of relationship people share with their land or the uh, in terms of the economy of livelihood it will be interesting to you know look at the kind of uh, the spirit of com communalism which exists perhaps in the you know uh, not really the primitive society but in, in many of the societies uh, even in the contem contemporary period like the indigenous communities now which we will come i mean the, had uh, at length discusses while we were talking about the idea of this indigenous knowledge traditional ecological knowledge which were pretty much uh, embedded in the indigenous community and how it is different from the formal or the western knowledge now therefore uh, this human environmental relationship also to be located because this idea of this paternalism of how for example the idea of this colonialism emerges in terms of you know intruding into the uh, premises of the indigenous people and as a result of that uh, this whole notion of perceiving the environment also changes to a large extent now again uh, how does we uh, make sense of uh, the environment by by picking up you know the kind of relationship between maybe let's say uh, the influence of culture magic so and so forth now for instance why does a particular community you know perform a certain kind of magic and and then what what does this witchcraft magic or oracles mean to those practicing i mean those communities who are practicing it now it is sort of uh, you know uh, an idea of this ethno science that is the amigenetic distinctions which uh, sort of uh, emerges now they they in a way perceive uh, in the exist uh, believe in the existence of these 
uh, supernatural powers and and nature in a way has to be uh, you know uh, sort of uh, familiarized by using certain kind of magics and spells now for instance in magics or in the practices of witchcraft certain kinds of spells are being made like for instance the incantations the words if you look at uh, i mean the in certain case studies you will in a way tries to look at the kind of how those spirits are being worshipped or sort of being appeased now appeasement is again uh, to you know bridge the gap between the natural world and the human world now therefore this appeasement in a way is sort of uh, a practice of reverence giving certain kind of respect or maybe uh, you know uh, seeking certain kind of you know maybe forgiveness permission so on and so on depending on the nature of what uh, is being done now therefore all these are being practices in order to you know make sense of uh, to establish a cordial relationship with nature now which will be you know different from the western science and then and per, perhaps all these practices are you know being categorized as irrational and which are based on mythical beliefs